And welcome to this session of uh, prime time. But uh, prime time goes on pretty much every Tuesday and Thursday all year long now. It's a joint production of the Friends of the Bethel Library, the library staff, and student development. I think is our faculty development. Uh, student uh, faculty development, I believe, is still in on that. And today we're. Um, Listening to Mark Bruce, Associate Professor of English, and his new publication, The Anglo-Scottish Borders and the Shaping of Identity, 1300 to 1600. And I'll just let you explain what the book is about. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So I think what I'm going to do here is um, uh, I've got some sort of pieces of the introduction that I'd like to read. Um, stop and explain a couple of things along the way. Uh, and then if there's time, um, have maybe a couple of suggestions about how a book like this might actually be useful a little more locally, um, even though it seems to be kind of esoteric subject matter. Um, so the, the, the introduction, which uh, was co-written co by myself, co-wrote, um, by myself and, and Catherine Terrell, who is um, at Hamilton College in New York. Um, we had a, a, an interesting experience several years ago where uh, we were both in the same panel at a conference at the big uh, International Medieval Studies Conference in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is kind of this legendary, weird gathering of medieval geeks that happens every year. Um, happened to realize we were interested in some of the same things, uh, both interest, uh, realized we were interested in post-colonial theory, um, were interested in applying that to Scotland since we were both interested in medieval Scotland as well. Um, so basically what happened is we started out by proposing a panel for a conference that we ran several years ago. And the panel went so well that we said, hey, let's, let's try and do something um, even more dangerous with all of this. Um, so um, this is the first part of uh, the introduction, which is called write, Writing Across the Borders. In the first stanzas of the late 14th century northern English romance, the Auntirs of Arthur at the Tarn Wadaline, an unexpected storm turns one of King Arthur's hunts to chaos. A sudden darkness falls and snow whips around the otherwise controlled and portly hunters as they scurry for cover. The Tarn bursts into flame. Guinevere and Gawain are cut off from the rest of the party in the confusion, and a grisly phantom accosts them, gliding across the burning water. The apparition turns out to be the soul of Guinevere's mother, now suffering torments and expiation of the pride and licentiousness she exhibited during her life. She warns Guinevere not to make the same mistake, despite the fine trappings and retinue of courtly sycophants that make it possible for her to maintain the illusion that all is well. The appearance in the second half of the poem of Galleron of Galloway, a Scottish knight who demands a judicial combat to recover land that Arthur unlawfully took from him and gave to Gawain confirms that all indeed is not. One striking feature of Aunt Pierce is its pervasive concern with borders and limits, with things that are never quite this or that. Even its setting evinces this concern with liminality. The first half occurs where land, a forest, the archetypal in-between space of medieval romance, meets water the Tarn Waddling, neither a full-blown lake nor yet quite dry land. Moreover, the Tarn Waddling had a reputation as a space where fairless wonders were likely to happen. Ralph Hanna explains that Tarn Waddling should almost certainly be understood as a place with spectral or magical connotations, possibly as a place where transfer from the other world, whether hell or fair, is possible. The ghost itself exists between life and death, spirit and corporeality, heaven and hell, reality and fairy. And its warning comes at a transitional moment in the traditional Arthurian narrative, just after Arthur's conquest of France, and just before his territorial acquisitiveness and or Guinevere and Lancelot's adultery begin tearing the kingdom apart. The plot thus occupies the seizure between the Arthurian kingdom's rise and its decline. And while Richard Maul argues that the poem authorizes the ghost's prophecy by pointing directly to the chronicle tradition of Arthurian narratives, it is also true that the prophecy implicitly invokes the romance tradition via the ghost's foreshadowing 
of Guinevere's affair with Lancelot. The story is thus placed in another liminal space between the romance and chronicle traditions of Arthurian narrative. A similar generic split divides the poem's two main episodes. The first relates to the medieval genre of exemplum, while the second typifies romance. The equal length of these episodes poises the poem on a fulcrum between genres, the effect of which is to interrogate the compatibility of Christian and chivalric virtues. Uh, A.C. Spearing has noted that the figure of the enthroned Arthur appears at the exact center of the two equally weighted sections of the poem, while references to and bracket the poem at the beginning and end. In this way, the poem mirrors the delicate balance in which Arthur's kingdom hangs, the wheel of fortune pausing before rolling toward tragedy. The poem thus places itself between heaven and hell, reality and fantasy, romance and history, spiritual and secular, life and death, success and failure. It cannot be insignificant, then, that the poem cites all these transitional states directly upon a geopolitical transition between two other states. Inglewood Forest, where the poem is directly set, lies directly on the Anglo-Scottish borders. In this collection, we seek to explore the effects of this liminal borderland on the construction of both English and Scottish identities. In recent years, several studies have addressed the creation and manifestation of bordered identities in medieval texts. These studies have tended to couch the question of liminal identities in terms of England's relationship with neighboring others, such as the Irish and Welsh, 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 Welsh. internal others, such as England's present or past Jewish population, and even more distant others, like Muslims of the Middle East. Surprisingly, however, there have been few studies of England's nearest and arguably most contentious other, Scotland. This collection undertakes to show that texts originating in the Anglo-Scottish marches, as well as texts that actively seek to negotiate Anglo-Scottish cultural and political relations, offer some of the most fruitful occasions for exploring the complicated intersections among medieval borders, nationalism, and identity forms. One purpose of the collection is simply to draw attention to the importance of the Anglo-Scottish border, both as a symbolic entity and a contested space of identity. In making this claim, the collection too crosses its own boundaries, bringing together scholars who work primarily on English materials with those who work primarily on Scotland, including different methodological approaches, from the theoretical to the traditional, and straddling the medieval and early modern divide. What unites the essays is their focus on the Anglo-Scottish border and the region surrounding it as a space of contact and exchange, a place of division that is also home to a cross-border culture whose denizens can display an almost simultaneous antipathy and affection toward their counterparts on the other side. The essays also reveal the border's reach, showing that its symbolic import extends deep into the official centers and discourses of each nation and that no text that traverses the border goes unmarked by the crossing. Above all, what emerges from these essays is a sense of the complexity of Anglo-Scottish political and literary relations, and the degree to which the borders themselves were integral to both English and Scottish imaginations. The symbolic fluctuations of the Anglo-Scottish border over the period covered by these essays make it a particularly resonant site for the investigation of these issues. The border itself changed little from its uh, 1237 delimitation in the Treaty of York to its formal reestablishment in 1552 after two centuries of Anglo-Scottish warfare. Yet its symbolic resonance changed dramatically from a purely political boundary to a marker of immutable difference. Andy King observes that the outbreak of war in 1296 saw the rapid dismantling of a cross-border society which had flourished for two centuries. In the 14th century, the imperatives of warfare, politics, and administration ensured that the marcher gentry on either side of the border thought of themselves as Englishmen or Scotsmen first, and marchers only second. This process of disengagement only continued. In the 15th century, Anthony Goodman finds two societies embattled against each other and more firmly integrated into their national communities. The border itself became an increasingly militarized zone as it moved from the periphery of both nations' concerns to a focus of policy. Moreover, 
Governments on both sides helped fuel the increasingly popular perception of the peoples across the border as intransigent national enemies. Yet despite the growing nationalism that informed border politics, the shared border culture was never entirely eclipsed. For much of this period, marchers on both sides of the border shared elements of a common culture as they had in the preceding centuries. Cynthia Neville, for example, demonstrates that the tradition of marcher law, an institution uniquely equipped to deal with cross-border disputes, what happens when somebody from the English side steals a goat from somebody on the Scottish side, who gets to adjudicate the crime, and how do you keep those kinds of hostilities from blowing up into all-out national war? Uh, continued into the early 16th century, despite Edward I's attempts to impose English common law on the region. In a different vein, Michael Brown suggests that lordship itself developed a number of distinctive characteristics in the border regions in the 14th and 15th centuries, owing to the English and Scottish monarchs' awareness of the particular demands and problems of leadership in such a heavily militarized region. What emerged was a region sharply divided by newly significant national allegiances. In other words, it was a pretty homogeneous, uh, congenial cross-border culture before war breaks out between England and Scotland in 1296. When that war happens, suddenly the line on the map matters a whole lot more than it used to, and suddenly the people that I've been interacting with like crazy are my enemies. Does that make sense? Um, so what emerged was a, reason sharp, a region sharply divided by newly significant national allegiances, yet one whose inhabitants still often had more in common with their cross-border enemies than with the denizens of the administrative centers of their respective kingdoms. Drawn together by cultural similarities and common economic and judicial interests, while simultaneously driven apart by opposed political allegiances and a growing discourse of national enmity, English and Scottish borderers had more complicated allegiances and more multifaceted identities than has often been recognized. To mention only one brief but suggestive example, here's my story. The 1323 attempt by Andrew Hartwell, the Earl of Carlisle, to enter into his own peace negotiations with Robert Bruce is generally treated in the English Chronicles as the worst kind of treason. This is a guy who was the Earl of Carlisle, which is in northern England, who actually, without the king's knowledge, tried to uh, make his own peace treaty with the Scots. Uh, basically because he felt like that was the only way he could protect his own people. In a typical interpretation, the Anonymal Chronicle, which is English, relates that Harkla, quote, entered into plots and conspiracies with the Scots to bring them to England to destroy the North Country, and his subsequent execution is roundly celebrated. On the Scottish side, Walter Bower follows his narration of Robert Bruce's successful raiding campaign that laid England utterly waste as far as York, with a single sentence regarding Hartlett's execution. However, he fails to mention Hartlett's crime, perhaps finding that English peacekeeping efforts ill afforded with his own celebration of Scottish violence. However, as the Carlisle produced Chronica and the Lanercost, a work uh, written right on the border, right in those regions, a work in which the clear writer clearly identifies as English and frequently vilifies the Scots, treats Harkla from a specifically northern perspective as a leader stepping in to protect his people where Edward II had failed. Although the chronicler admits that Harkla had exceeded his authority, he adds that, quoting, the poor folk, middle classes, and farmers in the northern parts were not a little delighted that the king of Scotland should freely possess his own kingdom on such terms that they themselves might live in peace. Later, in his description of Harkla's trial and execution, the chronicler goes out of his way to note that Harklet confessed himself to four different clergymen, quoting again, all of whom justified him and acquitted him of intention of taint and taint of treason, whence it may be that albeit he merited death according to the laws of kingdoms, his aforesaid good intention may yet have saved him in the sight of God. He, uh, he actually goes on to then uh, narrate Harkless' execution in exactly the same manner that you would see a martyr being executed in a saint's life. So he actually turns Harkless into a saint rather than a traitor. Uh, such a treatment of Harkless' story suggests that while the Lanarkos chronicler's loyalties 
and sense of identity were strongly and even militantly English, he had a different kind of awareness of events, one informed by life on a border in which Edward II's inability to consistently protect his northern subjects must have made Harkless' action seem more tragic than pernicious. Harkless' case demonstrates both the partisanship of writers uh, close to English and Scottish centers of power and, and the differently nuanced perspective available to even strongly nationalistic borderers. As a, both a distinctive geopolitical entity and a symbolic zone in which identities are compared, configured, contested, and reconfigured, the Anglo-Scottish border emerges as a crucial third turn in the articulation of English and Scottish national consciousness and cultural identity. While the Chronicle of Lanarkost illuminates the ways that practical challenges helped shape border perspectives, a work like the Antirs of Arthur suggests the resonance of a borderland that is at once literal and figurative. By setting a poem about multiple kinds of liminality directly on the geopolitical border, the Antirs poet reveals the symbolic import of that border, even as its literal presence lends the poem's more overtly symbolic qualities a real geopolitical context and relevance. The mingling of the actual and symbolic points to the liminal nature of the border itself. As Michelle Warren has noted, the figure of paradox inhabits all boundary concepts because the line of the limit seeks to institute an absolute difference at the place of most intimate contact between two spaces. All texts that navigate the bordered nature of Anglo-Scottish identities are in some way poised between these poles of difference and exchange. Yet texts that originate in the borderlands draw particular attention to the extremes of admiration and animosity that frequently coexist in their attitudes toward the national other. Perhaps because of the idiosyncratic history of the Anglo-Scottish border, where exclusionary nationalism rapidly overshadowed without entirely eclipsing a common culture, its borderlands complicate the models of cultural hybridity put forward by such theorists as Gloria and Soldua or Homi Baba, both of whom have theorized border relationships in other circumstances, Ansel Dua, Mexican and American border, uh, Homi Baba in uh, India, talking about post-colonial British stuff. Ansel Dua's La Conciencia Mestiza, Mestiza consciousness, hybrid consciousness, relies upon a tolerance for contradictions and a tolerance for ambiguity that seems less relevant for a border region whose two sides stem from a common Anglo-Norman background with many shared characteristics. On the one hand, denizens of the Anglo-Scottish border region had comparatively few cultural contradictions to be reconciled. On the other, the border's growing symbolic significance as a marker of immutable national difference discouraged the kind of conscious tolerance of hybridity that Ansel Dua celebrates, although it allowed for other kinds of cultural mingling. Baba's definition of hybridity as, quoting, a problematic of colonial representation that reverses the effects of the colonialist disavowal proves equally problematic when applied to the Anglo-Scottish situation. Although the English Edward I did assume direct rule over Scotland for a period of nine years, an act of colonialist aggression that inaugurated the lengthy Scottish Wars of Independence, England never fully established a colonial administration in Scotland, as, for instance, the English were to do in India much later. Um, and the power dynamics between the two nations never approached the stark imbalance that Baba identifies at the root of cultural hybridity. However, Lisa Lampert Wessig has recently questioned whether this sort of power asymmetry is necessary to the emergence of hybridity and suggests that medieval examples may add new dimensions to the way we could consider models of hybridity more generally. Accordingly, we, that's me and Catherine, argue that there is indeed a kind of hybridity at play in works that negotiate the borders of Anglo-Scottish identity, one that simultaneously affirms and complicates both pre-modern and contemporary ways of theorizing borders and bordered identities. Although articulations of identity are always relational, in this case the expression of identity regularly depends not merely on the idea of the other, but on the other's cultural productions, whether or not this debt is acknowledged or even recognize. Some of the essays actually talk about how, for instance, things that originated in a Scottish text get picked up by the English and used to 
uh, support a sense of English identity over and against the Scots and vice versa. So they're actually using each other's cultural productions to create a difference. Um, Robert Young reminds us of the dislocating double logic of hybridity in this way, which, quote, makes difference into sameness and sameness into difference, but in a way that makes the same no longer the same, the different no longer completely different. The Anglo-Scottish border becomes a place of transition at which discourses lose their univocality and become doubly significant. Even shared aspects of culture take on the additional resonance of national inflection, the same becomes different, while elements of each national culture can radically change meaning as they are grafted onto and absorbed into the other side's discourse. Difference becomes sameness. Although England and Scotland are often locked in an oppositional relationship, it is never simply that. Rather, each side becomes a crucial element in defining the other's identity, a dynamic that finds particularly intense expression in the border regions themselves, but which extends deep into the centers of royal power in each nation. The collection begins accordingly with considerations of works and perspectives originating within the Anglo-Scottish borderlands themselves, and then broadens to investigate how these border dynamics continue to operate at further removes. The first six essays proceed in rough chronological order from the early 14th through the 16th centuries, examining various manifestations of bordered identities and cross-cultural contacts. These essays stress the inevitable and ongoing hybridity of border productions, focusing on the interplay of difference and sameness, for example, the coexistence of strident nationalism with an appreciation of shared cultural values. The collection's perspective then widens to address texts, genres, and poetic forms that cross the literal and figurative border from England to Scotland, accruing symbolic capital while being transformed by their appropriation into the national hub. So for instance, one is about how a verse form called Rhyme Royal, which originates in England and is originally uh, used by Geoffrey Chaucer, uh, gets imported into Scotland and gets used by Scottish poets. What do they do with it different? How do they appropriate that form? Either deliberately reinvented or simply invested with new meaning through altered contexts, these hybrid aesthetic productions inevitably carry resonances of the border. The final two essays discuss how two Scottish makars, which is a specific Scottish word for the poet, uh, writing at or near the royal court construct versions of Scottish national identity through bordered tropes of hybridity, defining Scottishness primarily in relation to Englishness while celebrating their productive unions. Throughout the collection, myriad interpenetrations of culture manifest in often surprising ways, revealing not only the hybridity of the borderlands, but also the interdependence of English and Scottish cultures more broadly. Um, the seeming contradictions and successful subtleties of conceptions of national identity in all these essays remind us of the interdependence of Scottish and English cultures and self-conceptions. This interdependence, in turn, reminds us of the utility of attention to and across borders in any inquiry into the nature of identity. Homi Baba has demonstrated that the fictions of stability dramatized in official rhetorics of national identity tend paradoxically to reveal difference, threatening to expose the idea of the nation as constructive and contingent rather than nat natural and eternal. Um, so for instance, uh, for Scots, the Battle of Bannockburn in 13, 14, was, is generally something that's looked back to as a really defining moment in a Scottish national identity. But paradoxically, it also points to uh, a particular stage at which Scottish national identity could have been completely lost uh, had that been gone a different way. As the essays uh, in this volume show us, studies of the Anglo-Scottish border can reveal not only a troubled geopolitical zone, but also a figurative space of interaction, which casts into relief the contingency, complexity, and interdependence of narratives produced nearer to centers of power. The writer of the Antirs of Arthur seems well aware of this quality of the border. After all, the solutions offered by the characters in both halves of that poem seem to break down at its border location. Both Guinevere's promise to say masses for the spirit of her mother, which is how she deals with the accusations of her, and Arthur's solution of an additional land grant to Gawain in exchange for the return of Galleron's stolen land, proof thin indeed. 
Jean Yost uh, notes that both guilty parties, that is Guinevere and Gawain, superficially resolved the immediate crisis by having masses said or winning the battle, but ignore the larger, far more serious warning. Part of that warning, Patricia Ingham argues, is implicit in the politics of land grants in Arthur's so solution, which implies the conquest of yet more land in yet another neighboring country, Wales, which, uh, concerning which yet another disgruntled knight will likely appear in Arthur's court demanding a solution that requires still more conquest. The aesthetics of the poem and the political and economic realities of the marches collide in this instance, the poem seeming to question the effectiveness of the judicial combat, which is a very real border phenomenon even in the 14th and 15th centuries, in resolving land disputes, while the realities of border economics expose the poem's alternate resolution, Arthur's lordly generosity, as a romanticized fiction. In the end, Antirs de depicts the marches not simply as a limit of symbolic meaning or as a political and legal entity, but as a place in which the figurative, political, and economic collide, each forcing the reader to confront the instability of all three. The very real phenomenon of marcher law and the fantasies of courtly unity that hold the Arthurian society together are both exposed as shams. In each of the poem's two episodes, a figure from the border, the ghost, then Galeron steps in to unmask the fantasies of stability that cannot stand in a region in which the real circumstances of border life consistently belie any notion of stability or control. Such illusions might be possible to maintain elsewhere, in places where there is less to disturb the thin gauze of courtly propriety that holds the poem's Arthurian community together. Such illusions may be possible perhaps for a Plantagenet or a Bruce, <laughs> but not for a gallery or a harkla, not here at the Tarn Waddling, where the courtly veneer is whiffed away by nothing more than a dark sky and a snowstorm, where both romance and law break down, and where all it takes to clinch the inevitable downfall of the fantasy of identity that is the Arthurian kingdom is a trip to the border. Um, Okay, so I've got another couple minutes and we can still have questions here. So I, I want to do, uh, I want to suggest a little more current relevance. One might ask, I'm writing at this point, what relevance any of this inquiry has for any areas of interest outside of medieval studies, and especially what relevance it might have for issues of current interest among the scholarly community at Bethel. Uh, and there are a number of qualities of the book that may at first glance make it seem as though it has very little relevance to issues of immediate concern here. For, for example, you may have noticed that I haven't said word one about pietism. <laughs> um, I, I have not included any uh, reflection on the integration of faith and learning. Uh, and I can also confirm after an exhaustive word search of the manuscript that no form of the word irenic is used anywhere <laughs> in the entire volume. Um, so, uh, despite these obvious shortcomings, I can think, <laughs> I can think of a couple of ways uh, a book like this might actually be useful more locally. Um, for example, one might zoom out a bit from the book's medieval subject matter and see it as a kind of meditation on the idea of a difficult middle and recognize that Bethel inhabits a lot of those. Uh, for instance, we often ride a line between a desire to maintain a high degree of doctrinal orthodoxy and a desire for the kind of free inquiry that characterizes a university. We come under attack on occasion, both from those who would view any devotion to a doctrinal identity as anathema to academic inquiry, and who for that reason might insist on seeing Bethel as a source of indoctrination more than education, a Bible college rather than a university. But we also get criticism from the other end of the spectrum, too, from those who believe that even the desire to understand other faiths can only corrupt orthodoxy. The fact that Bethel gets criticism from both extremes itself suggests that Bethel exists on a kind of middle ground that those on either extreme seem interested in effacing rather than acknowledging. The middle ground on which we live, from those two very real perspectives, shouldn't exist. It's one or the other, either one of us or one of them. We find ourselves in the position, in this case, of borders, as affected by the conflict between the identities that lie on either side of us and denied reality by those on either side of us, as we are interested in exploring the strange and battled region in which we live, and in which, as in the case of Andrew Harkleff, things that seem to us like simple acts of survival register on either side of us as acts of treason. 
Perhaps the present volume in this context might be seen as a potential model for mapping rather than effacing the difficult middle ground we inhabit. What might it mean to explore that particular border? What might exploring that border and the ways in which it is inhabited, negotiated, and crossed suggest about the ex not about the exclusivity, but rather the interdependence of the identities on either side? and what possibilities for a better kind of imagination might lie within. The idea of imagination leads me to a second suggestion, uh, having to do with the fact that many on the faculty and staff are preparing to engage in an intentional dialogue in the coming months about Christian civility in political, national, and religious discourses. One thing that I think I learned from working on this anthology has to do with the degree to which literary imagination affects political discourses of identity, both for good and ill. Uh, both the English and Scottish monarchies, for instance, were able to deploy literary representation in order to foster senses of national identity that both supported specific political regimes and, in the service of those same regimes, created and fostered enmity for a political other who was, in many ways, so much like the political self that imaginative action was the only means by which a sense of difference could be created. On the other hand, as some of the essays in the volume show, literature can also be the source of alternative imaginings. Uh, Chelsea Honeyman, for example, in what's become my personal favorite essay in the collection, examines the way some of the poems of the Scottish poet William Dunbar use an organic metaphor to suggest an alternative political vision for the relationship between England and Scotland. Honeyman engages in a reading of the rich horticultural images that Dunbar uses to characterize the 1503 marriage of the Scottish King James IV to the English Margaret Tudor. She argues that Dunbar, Dunbar's metaphors preserve both James's Scottish and Margaret's English identities, but only insofar as the marriage increases the autonomy and authority of the Scottish Stuart line through grafting the vitality of Margaret's Tudor robes onto the stock of the Scottish thistle. In contrast to other characterizations of the marriage, which in England saw the Tudor Rose as crowding out the Scottish thistle altogether, or characterizations in Scotland that imagined the grafting of the Tudor Rose as an affront to the purity of the Scottish royal stock, Dunbar envisions an image that does not erase one identity in favor of the other, but rather maintains both, the mutual strengthening of both. Perhaps studies like those in a book on the Anglo-Scottish borders in the Middle Ages then can actually help us in our discussions here about how, as believers, we might best negotiate national, political, and religious differences as examples of how we might examine rather than ignore the middle grounds between the categories that are more often starkly realized only as binary relationships between us and them to explore the roles of literary imagination in the creation of those identities and to reveal in the end the ways in which that same literary imagination might help us envision better alternatives. So that's that. Uh, <laughs> so we've got questioning time. If there are questions, I guess. Yes, sir. Um, I was very evocative, Mark. Um, very interesting. And I was thinking about a couple of uh, directions that, that this the reflection could go. One is to think about internal borders. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I thought about three. Um, and this is maybe extending your argument in a direction that you're not going right now, but I'm wondering about borders um, that are formed by national parks and which suggest interesting relationships between the human and the, uh, and, and the natural, social and natural mm -hmm. world. I think about borders that remain um, uh, with Native American reservations uh, and the kinds mm -hmm. of uh, historical events those, those keep inscribed. Uh, but most importantly, when you mentioned the uh, Battle of Bonnet Burden and that being a I think about the way in which um, the Battle of Gettysburg uh, functions as a kind of liminal moment uh, for U.S. identity and how different that battle looks in the northern and the southern perspective and how the Mason-Dixon line remains a kind of internal border. Mm -hmm. so I'm just, just throwing those out there as possible other yeah. directions to go. And I think one of the ways I'm sort of imagining the way a study like this might be kind of interesting outside of just people who are interested in in a medieval Anglo-Scottish relations is just in the way it's kind of models an idea of how to take uh, something like that, you know, where is that sort of difficult middle ground that nobody wants to acknowledge between sort of northern and southern identities, for instance, uh, who lives there, what do they deal with, what does their consciousness look like, 
uh, how does the consciousness that they develop in that sort of marginal space affect discourses on either side. Um, and by looking at that very closely and actually mapping it out instead of just going for the kind of us-them division, um, can that tell us something? Yeah. Well, as someone who grew up on the Mason-Dixon line, yeah. uh, some of them look like me, uh, yeah. <laughs> and some of them don't. Uh, I have a different question for you, uh, and that is, um, you, you talked a, a, another thing that's very striking about Scottish history is its alliance with continental mm -hmm. culture, especially French, uh, but then also the universities in Scotland were much better than the universities in England through the mm -hmm. 18th century at least, yeah. in part because they had continental uh, relationships. And I'm wondering if uh, England thinks of itself as an island, and it doesn't even consider Scotland as part of the island at times. It's insular, whereas Scotland is more continental. Yeah. And I wonder if that, uh, if you have thought about that as another way mm -hmm. of establishing Scottish identity in particular. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that, that was a question that kind of grew out of this book, but wasn't part of it. Um, because part of what we were trying to do is just take that single border and focus right there. Right. Um, but what comes out in some of the essays is exactly that idea that in some ways Scotland has, even in the Middle Ages, has a kind of more international character in some ways than England does because there are ties with France, there are ties with, uh, you know, economic ties with like the Hanseatic League. Uh, and my question is, yeah. the, there's the economic and the political and the religious and how did, does that play into the imaginative and literary? Yeah, how that um, it, it does in some ways. For instance, um, one of the one of the chronicles I referred to uh, is by a guy named Walter Bauer. It's called the Scota Chronicle. Um, and in in the preface to one of the manuscripts of that chronicle, Walter Bauer goes into this long diatribe about how he is just as good a scholar as anybody in England. Uh, and he was, of course, trained at the Scottish universities. Um, his Latin in that chronicle is like the most hot-dogging Latin I have ever, every sentence is like trying to do a crossword puzzle. Um, you know, the, the, you know the, the, the subject is on page 12 and the verb is on page 17, you know. Um, and it, he, he comes across as feeling like, even though he's been trained in that very cosmopolitan university environment in Scotland, he acts like he's really got something to prove uh, because his training was in Scotland and not uh, in England. Um, so he seems to be reacting against this idea in England that nobody from Scotland could be anything but kind of a provincial bumpkin. Um, you know, even though he's able to demonstrate erudition beyond what a lot of Scott, uh, English chroniclers can do. Um, so uh, that definitely plays in. There's, there's definitely this view of, of the Scots from central England as just, Scotland is just kind of this hell and gone type place. Um, and, uh, you know, regardless. And so they seem to kind of ignore those international things, whereas in the Scottish text you see people using those connections all the time. And, and even the poetry in the Middle Ages takes on a much more broad international character. Did I answer your question? Uh, sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> more, more to be said. Well, I guess we're good then. <laughs> Thank you very much.